Hey, Sydney, are you feeling good? That's good to know. In that case, please welcome onto stage Skull Poseidon. Hello. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming to the show. I've been absolutely loving Australia. You know, it is hard for me as a South African to be here because I don't just want to make people laugh. I want to motivate people like, hey, come to South Africa because it's an amazing... <laughs> That's never gotten a big laugh before, but... <laughs> it wasn't even a joke. But... Um... <laughs> I do, I do, fuck, fuck, fuck you guys, you live here, okay? <laughs> I want people to come visit us, who's still there, you know? Because South Africa is one of those places, this, this, this is something I found, like wherever in the world I've been that most people have in common is that people want to visit South Africa once in their life. It's a bucket list country for a lot of people, it's just one of those places. It's not like fucking Chad. Like if I said to you now, sir, all expenses paid trip to Chad. You'd be like, what are my other options? Is, is it only Chad? Can I get the cash? But South Africa is one of those places. But the, the, the position that I'm in as a South African, unfortunately, is that, you know, you have to be honest with people when they ask, unfortunately, because this is what always happens. People hear my accent, they go, where are you from? I go, South Africa. And then they go, ooh, I've always wanted to go. And then I say, yes, you should, you should, it's amazing. And then they go, is it safe? And then you go, no. <laughs> you know. And we have these default answers as South Africans. We don't even have to think about it anymore. You go, look, it is safe. Um, <laughs> It is, but you need to know where to go, okay? You can't just come freestyle there in South Africa. You need to know the areas, okay? <laughs> or one of my favorites is, look, it is safe, it is, but um, don't be stupid. People think they know what you mean. They go, ooh, you mean don't be stupid, like don't walk in a dodgy area at night. Just don't walk at night. At all. Like not even in your house. Just, just get into bed and then you stay there until the sun comes up again. What if I need the toilet? You piss in the bed. That's, that's what we do. But I feel, you know, I feel at home here. You know, I don't feel like I'm in a different country, really. People scare you when you go somewhere for the first time. People scare you. The South Africans back home, it's my first time in Australia. They said, ooh, prepare yourself. And I go, really? Because what I see on the internet and social media and stuff doesn't look that crazy different. And they go, no, a lot of rules. <laughs> As a South African, I said, what's that? But... <laughs> Look, there are, there are a lot of rules, you know. The, the craziest one for me is like, you know, that people wait for the green man. Three in the morning, there's four cool cars. For days, people wait. Then sometimes I stand there and I go, okay guys, I'm gonna go. And then, you know, they chat amongst themselves. He's going, he's going, he's going, he's going. The part where I saw, okay, this is really different to South Africa was, you know, I got in Melbourne, I got a bicycle. You know, my friend lives there. He has a cool bicycle, one of those with a battery, makes you go fast. And I thought, ooh, I'm going to cycle to all my gigs. So I lent the bicycle from him for about two weeks. And then the Australians that I met, they said, just remember, it's illegal in Australia to ride your bicycle drunk. So the same as a car, drunk driving is illegal. I was like, what kind of nanny state bullshit is that? <laughs> A car, I understand, but a bicycle. If I knock into you, I'm gonna bruise your shin at most. I feel like if, cause you know, it's quite an achievement to ride a bicycle drunk successfully. You know, it's something that requires balance and you've taken something that makes you unbalanced. I feel if the police catch you successfully riding your bicycle drunk, they should congratulate you and send you on your way. 
They should give you points for successfully riding. That's, that's the only thing. Otherwise, the country is very similar if you think about it. Australia and South Africa, big rugby nations, okay? Big drinking cultures, both of our countries. Australia and South Africa, lots of animals that can kill you. We just have more people that can kill you. So, I guess that means we win. <laughs> Sorry, Australia, but we one up you on that one. Really one up you on that one. And, uh, you know, the frustrating thing is as well that people, in 2023, you would think people know about South Africa. People still have a misconception in 2023. I was in Dubai for shows, and then I was taking the Uber back to the airport, and the Uber driver said, where's your accent from? I said, South Africa. He said, ooh, very dangerous. Very dangerous in South Africa. I said, yeah, no, no, look, it is. It's dangerous. And he said, because of all the snakes. I said, the what? He said, the snakes. A lot of dangerous snakes there in South Africa. I was like, bro, you, you don't even know how happy we would be if our biggest problem was fucking snakes. If our biggest problem was snakes, we would be in the street every day, full on Shakira. Tamina, mina, eh, eh, waka, waka, eh, eh. We'd be so happy if our biggest problem was snakes. Then you also have the other side of the spectrum. Now, I met this woman in Adelaide, and the same thing. She said, where's your accent from? North Africa. She said, I've always wanted to go. I said, you should, it's amazing. And then she said, but Skulk, I'm scared. I said, me too. <laughs> what do you think I'm doing in South Africa? Relaxing. I'm shitting myself as well. She said she's so scared because her friend at work told her, this, these, these are the rumors that's going around. Her friend at work told her that every day in South Africa, people are getting decapitated <laughs> in the streets. I said to her, listen, that is completely false, okay? I, I promise you that is not happening. You can come and you can chill. People are not getting decapitated in the streets every day in South Africa. And she said, okay, so that's never happened. I said, well, I'm not saying that. <laughs> We've had a long history, you know. I'm sh sure there's been a fucking decapitation or two. Because this is, this is the difficult position that I'm in. Nah? I can't make her feel too comfortable because what if she's the one that comes to South Africa and gets fucking decapitated? I don't want that blood on my hands. I'm, I'm not even saying it's going to be a person that's going to do it. She might go on safari, stick her head out the window. Hello, kitty. Rah! Lion takes her head off. No. So, you know, that, that's... That's the position that I'm in, but I've been, I've been loving it. Do, do we have any Aussies in tonight? Any Aussies? What, what, what is your name, ma'am? Louise. Louise, I, I have to give it to you guys. I, I wanted to hate your country a little bit. Because so many South Africans move here, I wanted to go back and tell the rest, it's not that nice. But it is. I can't fault it. I went for a run, I saw this beautiful white parrot. Just there, just there. It had like a yellow fucking... <laughs> thing and everything. You know, Louise, back home, you see one of those, you catch it for the reward. You don't just see those. That's a rich person's parrot that's escaped. That's a billionaire's exotic pet. And then I kept on running. I saw another one and another one and another one. I realized, oh, these are just the birds you have here. These are your pigeons. It's amazing. 
And Australians, I like the way you guys handle things. You know, tricky, complicated history. Australia, let's not beat around the bush. So does South Africa. But we tend to sweep things under the rug. You know, we don't talk about the issues. You guys address the issues. I mean, there was, before the show now, acknowledgement of country. I didn't know about it. You know, came here, no one told me. Started in Adelaide, the tour, and I went to go watch a comedian I'm a big fan of. And the lights go down in the theatre. I expect him to come out. Then there's the voice. We acknowledge that the land used to belong to the First Nations people. We acknowledge their forefathers. A lot of acknowledging going on in the acknowledgement of country. <laughs> Don't know if you've realised. We acknowledge we took the land. Can we have it back? No, but we acknowledge... <laughs> We acknowledge that you are upset <laughs> and we further acknowledge, thank you. Do you know, the, 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 first, the first time I heard it, you know, genuinely I thought it was beautiful. I really did. I thought it was beautiful and I even looked at the other Australians uh, around me, you know, to see what is their reaction and everyone was going, mm. <laughs> yes. Yes. So that was my first thought. Wow, that's great. That's beautiful. My second thought was, Fox, should we be doing that? Because we've just moved on, eh? We've just gone. Okay, everyone, fine. No take backs. We're not talking about apartheid ever again. Thank you. Closing that chapter. Thank you. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. No wonder Australians are so confident. Why wouldn't you be? Louise, everything works. You've got electricity 24-7. <laughs> when the lights go off, it's because you switch them off. <laughs> you know what a privilege that is. If I, if I lived here, I would just play with it every day. On, off, on, off, on, off, on, off. It's like magic. Australians, confident people. I took an Uber, Uber ride and it, it, was a, it was a white Australian man was my Uber driver. This guy was so confident he didn't turn on the radio but he sang all the way there. <laughs> Katy Perry Raw. <laughs> Difficult song, no? You gonna hear me roar. Oh, 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 oh. No backtrack a cappella. I was like, wow. This is, that's, that's confidence. We don't have that, South Africans. We have a low self-esteem. I guess it's because of all the crap that goes on back home. You know, we have a low self-esteem. I mean, prime example, the Queen of England passed away the other day. Now, I'm Afrikaans. All the old Afrikaans women on Facebook, they go on there, rest in peace, Queen. Rest in peace. I was like, wow, rest in peace. Did we forget? Our most famous war now, in the Afrikaans culture the Anglo-Boer War, okay? The British versus the Afrikaans. They came to South Africa. Fuck those up, no? <laughs> Burned down our farms, put innocent women and children in concentration camps. Historically, that's the enemy. Now we're going, rest in peace, queen. All the other countries that were colonized, bye-bye, bitch. We in South Africa, <laughs> not us, we over there. Rest in peace, queen. Gone too soon, 96. Gone too soon, 96. Not if you're asking Charles. He's been there the last 20 years, every birthday. Happy birthday to you. 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96. <laughs> but
But just to, just to tell everyone uh, where I'm from, you know, people who don't know me, is, you know, I grew up, easiest would be to say Johannesburg, but it's actually an hour out of Johannesburg by the airport, an airport, an area called Kempton Park. Nah? Got a few East Randers in, that's nice. You guys got your first because you're the closest to the airport. It's a stupid joke, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> no, so, you know, Kempton Park, it's a, it's a bit of an uh, area. Um, I, I was, at some stage, you know, quite, quite shy to say I'm from Kempton Park. Now I own it because there's lots of comedians from Joburg, no comedians from Kempton Park. So that's something unique to me now. And I, I had a beautiful moment the other day in Kempton Park. I would say a career-defining moment in Kempton Park. So I did a big show there. Normally I would stay at my parents' house. They've lived there my whole life. But I decided, you know what, it's a big show. I'm going to treat myself. I booked myself into the nicest hotel in Kempton Park. <laughs> okay, thank you. I know that's like saying... I'm the koala with the most chlamydia. But it's like, what are you achieving? But, you know, it, it was a big moment for me. By the way, have, have you done that, uh, Louise? Have you held the koala? You have. I also, it was a touristy thing I did. Yeah, I touched the koala. Not in a weird way. Um, you know, I paid. Um, <laughs> But fuck, what a rip-off, eh? $29 to hold this koala for like 30 seconds and have your picture taken. I know, Louise, I know that's for you guys not a lot of money, $29. Eh? But for us, like if you come here with rands, it's, it's quite a lot. Like, I mean, McDonald's back home, it's cheap. It's cheap. Eh? Macca's here. Yeah. A quarter pound of cheeseburger and six nuggets. For that amount of money, you know what I can get with that in South Africa, Louise? A car. <laughs> but I did it, you know, I, I held, I held the koala, $29, you know. I was so surprised when I left the sanctuary when they said, Sir, you can't keep the koala. I said, what do you mean I don't keep the koala for $29? And you would think for $29, the least this koala could do is fucking crack a smile. <laughs> Not even looking at the camera. Now I'm standing there, with my best smile, this koala, the... and looking over there. $29, you know, this koala made me realize I'm not a good businessman because I'm always, after the show, taking pictures with people for free, like an idiot. This koala, $29. Now, $29. I'm a bit obsessed. I worked it out. So, this koala is taking 10 pictures every 15 minutes. That's over $1,000 an hour. Dude, I've been on Netflix. I've never flown business class in my life. This koala, with what he's making, is flying business class, doing cocaine out the pilot's belly button. This fucking koala. And then they have the audacity at the sanctuary to get upset with you if you call it a bear. Because it's a marsupial, whatever that means. I didn't know that. I'm standing there and it's awkward as well because now there's a whole queue of people. I'm there by myself. They're all watching you take the picture. You know, so you're standing there. Uh, you know, you're feeling awkward. So you just say something for the sake of saying something. So you go, oh, you know, I've always wanted a picture with a koala bear. And this lady, she shits on me, she goes, don't call it a bear, it's not a bear. I was like, lady, for $29, I'll call this thing fucking Winnie the Pooh if I want to, okay? <laughs> so what's the matter? You've been on your phone, you know, for... Is there an emergency back home? Oh, are you ordering drinks? I would love a glass of red wine, actually, if you're ordering. <laughs> Fuck, this comedy club is fancy, eh? Because like... I was like, who's he messaging? Is it the babysitter? No, you're getting drinks for the group. That's why you were talking to him. You're like, what do you want to drink? I'm just ordering you on the app. 
Jeez, that's very nice. So how does it, can I? Okay, we don't, know, we don't have time for it right now, but afterwards, please show me. That's very, it's a great business model, wow. You just scan that thing and you get a drink. Shit, Australia. Yeah, you know, it's... You know, I, I give you points for trying, but it didn't really make sense because it's like, tw for, you know, uh, but anyway, but yes. Those are the hardest heckles, the one that don't really make sense because it's like if someone had to shout like, Hullabaloo! And you're like, yeah, fuck, yes, yeah. <laughs> anyway, did you order the, the red one now? No, please go back on it and order it. The whole koala joke, I was like, what the fuck is going on here? You know, they were having a good time. I was going through a mental crisis. I'm like, geez, is this koala joke that I've worked so hard on so shit that this guy is on Instagram? So please order the glass of red wine. It's the least you can do. Thank you. A glass of ice as well, I'll pay for that. Um, <laughs> so uh, anyway, okay. Career defining moment in Kenton Park. I check into the hotel that I'm staying at and the lady behind reception says, Mr. Poseidon, I've given you a free upgrade to the honeymoon suite. I thought, wow, the honeymoon suite, that's so nice. And then in my head, I thought, is it? Because I don't know if I want to sleep in the bed that's been sexed in the most. Because we, we romanticize the honeymoon suite, you know, who everyone wants to stay in the honeymoon suite. If you think about it, that's the most fucking gross bed in the hotel. Like, why do we pay extra for that? That should be the cheapest bed in the hotel. It's just springs at this stage. <laughs> and also the type of people staying in the honeymoon suite in a hotel in Kempton Park, don't? No, I... <laughs> Good people. Salt of the earth, okay? But, you know, they've probably been saving for a long time to go do this and maybe it's their, their only trip for the year. So, I mean, they're really gonna get their value for money. You know, they, they're gonna utilize every surface. That's why it's not the most gross bed, it's the most gross room. Actually, like you open the tap, someone has sex on the tap, I promise you. Someone has tapped it on the warm tap. Oh, thank you, sir. Oh, it's coming now. Yeah, okay. Still a long show. Don't worry. I'll wait for that glass. So, you know, I was, I was staying there in the honeymoon suite. Um, you know, that, that's where I'm from, like I said, Kempton Park. I was just in a normal public school, middle class, you know, didn't really do the stereotype thing of um, Afrikaans boy playing rugby, but I did sports. You know, um, long distance running, that was my thing. 1,500 meters, 3,000 meters. Look, it's gone a bit quiet, your instinct is right. <laughs> I wasn't in the top half. <laughs> but I made the team! <laughs> we had a name and everything, the kamikazes. That's what we were called, the kamikazes. Quite hectic, eh, to say that to a little boy coming into the school. What are we called, coach? The kamikazes! You're a Japanese fighter pilot, boom, crash, into the enemy, suicide mission. You're gonna give your life for this. I manage expectations very quickly. I was like, I'm all here for fun and fitness, coach, so... Not gonna give my life for this. If I get tired, I will slow down. If I get a sharp pain in my chest, I will stop. I will physically stop the race. I will not push through the pain to see what happens. But we had the world's most passionate coach. His name was Coach Sean Nodia. 
You know what made him so good? He believed that the mental is as strong, if not stronger, than the physical. Which is bullshit. Okay? <laughs> It's all about the physical, unfortunately. You can't pass a rugby ball with your mind. You have to physically use your fork and arms. And he would take us on these training camps there in the north of our country, an area called Tanin, Marensky, because he believed in high altitude training. So we were running there through the woods like Falcon Kenyans, we could hardly breathe. And that was just in the day. In the evening, we'd have the mental training. And he would tell us the story every night. Eventually, we were so bored, we heard it a million times, we'd fall asleep. But he loved the story to motivate us. Like, sir, what is your name? I, I gave you a hard time earlier, but what is your name? Leon. Leon. Okay, that's better. <laughs> well, what, what do you do for a living, Leon? Work in IT. And do you, do you, you look like you're in good shape though. Do you exercise? A little bit. What do you do for exercise? Weights. Where do you weights? <laughs> so why is this the night of shit jokes? I'm so sorry, Leo. But how, how much do you, how much do you pick up? Not much. Okay, I'm gonna tell you this story, Leon, because I can see the physical is there, but the mental. Okay? When I'm done with you, you're gonna be faster than fucking fiber. I was trying to bring the IT into it, Leon, it didn't. What, what kind of, well, what, what in the IT department do you, are you in the antivirus or? Oh, you are? Security? Wow, okay. Now, because I'm one of those people, it says, you know, the antivirus thing comes up and it says renew subscription. Now I'm just like, $29, not a fork. <laughs> but I haven't gotten a virus yet. But I also don't click on, like, the pop-ups. Nah, when it's like, check on a Ferrari. It's like, <laughs> two kilometers away. I don't believe you. <laughs> Too many of you identified with that. Too many of you have been like, yes, I don't know, eh? <laughs> that does look like the street here. To... Could be, it could be. Um, I'm going to tell you this story. I'll paint you the picture. This is the story we were told, the story of La Severin. I'll paint you the picture. It's the 1972 Olympics. La Severin is there. He's a fucking fan. He's from Finland. <laughs> and he's lining up. Thank you. <laughs> and he's lining up to run the 10,000 meter final for men. He goes down, that gun goes, oh, trigger warning for the South Africans. <laughs> A gun is gonna go off in this point of the story. I know all of you have PTSD, okay? This is my hand shaped like a gun. Leon, touch it, verify. It's just a hand, okay? I'm gonna make a sound with my mouth, don't shoot back. So. Gun goes off. Poof. Now, you know at the beginning of the race, nah, everyone's pushing and shoving to get to the front. And what happens to Lasseveren? He falls hard. But harder than hard. Most people at this point would just admit defeat and walk off. But what does Lasseveren do? Sir, please start the slow clap. He gets up. He runs like he's never run before. And he ends up winning the 10,000 meter final for me. New Olympic record, La Severin. And that was our coach's favorite story, no? So. 
When we ran against other schools, most coaches would stand there by the 200 meter mark, and as the athletes come past, they would shout, go sprint, give it your all, it's the last 200 meters. Our coach, this is what made him so good, he would stand by the 300 meter mark, because he believed that last 100 meters you blacked out anyway. <laughs> he would stand there, and as you come past, he would shout, So inspiring. <laughs> but if you were me and you were second last, it was like, it's a bit late now, coach. <laughs> the guy who won has won already. Okay, he's already sucking a fucking guava ice lolly. <laughs> there by the tuck shop. He's got his tracksuit on. In fact, I think he left. He's home already, so. <laughs> Next time, can you shout it at the beginning of the race? That's when I need it. My dad would always stand next to the coach. It was always a lot of pressure when my dad was there. My dad was a wonderful athlete when he was young. Has a record that stands to this day in Kempton Park. <laughs> First athlete in Kempton Park High School to run the 800 meters under two minutes. Impressive, because it can never be beaten. Because no one can be the first again. No one can be the first guy to run the 800 meters under two minutes after the first guy to run the 800 meters under two minutes. So that record stands today. He would stand next to the coach, but you know, my dad has a bit more of a sense of humor. So the coach would be shouting, La Severin! My dad would be next to him, Million! Skulky Million! <laughs> now I'm gonna translate. Louise, Million, a milli. Af it's Afrikaans fries, okay? Milli, corn on the cob. Okay, on the same page, corn on the cob. Home, translation, him. Put them together, corn on the cob, him. I don't know why they're laughing, they also don't get it. Because it's made up. It's made up. My dad's coach made it up. When my dad was a kid, he used to shout million for my dad, thought it sounded motivational. My dad passed it down next generation to me. And yes, of course, million, corn on the cob him. Of course, it doesn't make sense linguistically. But in a weird way, it did make sense. Because, dude, I'm telling you, if you went for a jog tomorrow and I jumped out of a bush and I shouted, Million! You'd fucking go. You wouldn't know why, but you would... You would speed up. You would pick up some pace. But, you know... Eventually, I decided the physical stuff is not for me. I joined the chess team. At least I had that insight as a child to go, this thing is not working for me, I'm gonna try something else. Not all kids have that. And the problem is we as adults, we motivate kids even if they suck at something, you know? <laughs> Athletics day, there was always that child who's getting lapped on the 100 meters. <laughs> and then he comes past and, and the teachers are shouting, you can do it, Amy. You can do it, Amy. Amy clearly can't fucking do it. <laughs> Pull him off the field. Say, so, here's a calculator and an asthma pump. There you go. <laughs> Sign cos and tan. Yo, try this. But now we're motivating this poor child, you know? So I, I had that insight. I was like, the physical stuff is not for me. I joined the chess team, best decision I ever made. Because that was the first time in my life I came into contact with English kids. Like South African English kids. I tell people, yes, there were English children in Kempton Park, but we never saw them. <laughs> they drove to school. Afrikaans kids, you must understand, eh? we were in public schools. Afrikaans kids, we normally went to public schools. You didn't choose your school. Your school was the one closest to your house, the, the one you could walk to, the one you could ride your bicycle. The English kids would go to private schools there in Joburg, an hour away. Their parents didn't want to drive that, so they would send buses to Kempton Park, pick up all the rich English kids, and then whisk them away. 
to the big city and we'd always run after the bus barking. <laughs> and I'm not gonna lie, I wanted to be in a private school. I wanted to be, oh, so bad. It just looked next level. They had a pool. We had a sprinkler. If you wanted to cool down, you had to wait for it to come past, and then on the fast part, you had, you had to get wet. Now that I'm older, of course, I realize that's where the scandals happen. Private schools, all fine and well, but whenever you see scandals that happens in a school, it's always the private schools. The more money you pay, the bigger the scandal. There was a big scandal in Cape Town a year or two ago, Bishop's College, very nice, private school there, boys school, they had a, 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 the water polo team and they had a young female coach, you can use your imagination. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Uh -huh. and, uh -huh. and everyone freaked out. Everyone said, yeah, Yo, you see, it's all beautiful and shiny from the outside, but the system is rotten at the core. I was like, ugh, everyone relax. The same things happen at public schools. We just don't see it as a scandal. <laughs> we advertise it at the open day. We say, come to Kempton Park High School. We got good academics and you'll get a hand job from the hockey teacher. <laughs> and the parents are impressed. They're like, wow, that's different, Yuan. Okay. That's a feature. That's included in the school fees, no? Noted. Noted. And you know, I don't want to brag, but we were the only sports team that played against English schools. The other sports, rugby, cricket, they played only against other Afrikaans schools. Their world was this small. We'd go to Joburg, play against these fancy English private schools there, St. John's, St. Stidians. We didn't even know the ST stood for Saint. <laughs> we just called it St. John's, the Stidians. I was like, fuck, do these kids have a stutter? Where do you go? Stestidians! This poor child is embarrassing himself. Take out the first turn. <laughs> and we, we had the best time. We had the best time. We didn't care about the chess. We just wanted to go explore in the school. St. John's, we used to say, we're going to Hogwarts today. Because compared to our, you know, government school, our public school, this place looked like a castle. And we had the best toy. The kids today have amazing technology. They won't know. The, the beautiful simplicity of this toy. Who here is like under 23 years old? Okay, under 25. Feeling alive, under 25. How old are you? Hey? 30. Fuck, you look fantastic. Okay. Uh, how old are you guys? 30. Okay. Is it, is it now? How old are you, dude? 23. Okay, what, what, what do you do here in Australia? <laughs> IT. IT? Fuck, is this a corporate? What is it? Would you all work on, Leon? And what, if he's in antivirus, what are you? Service desk. Service desk. Yes. Oh, so you the switch it on and off. <laughs> <laughs> Read the back of the box. Oh. No, I didn't charge it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Dude, well, what is your name? Sam. Sam, okay. Well, Sam, you know, you guys have amazing, because I, I know it sounds like I'm saying we had the best years growing up in you guys, but you, you have amazing technology, but just the simplicity of this, you know, it's, there's something beautiful about it. There was a lady outside the school that would sell this toy for five rand, which is like minus an Aussie dollar. You know? <laughs> Spongebob, Spongebob this big, attached to a stretchy string with a plastic ring that goes over your finger and then you just fork it.
The point wasn't to hit it against your hand, just left to right. <laughs> Hours of entertainment. But now you have to go finish your chess game and you're playing against these English private school kids. And they took the game so seriously. <laughs> I mean, We're playing school level chess. They took the rules so seriously. There was a rule called touch move. So if you touch a piece, if you, <laughs> that's just the South African in me coming up. If you, <laughs> if you touch a piece, you have to move it. That's the rule. But now sometimes, what will happen, you reach for your pawn, and then your school's blazer will accidentally knock your horse. And then they'll go, touch move, you have to move out. <laughs> you have to move out, touch move. And then you go, listen, I don't want to move my horse because then you're going to take my queen. Look at the board, you're going to beat me anyway. I just want to go play with my baliki in the school, okay? <laughs> just let me lose fair and square. And then they go, ma'am, and you're like, oh, really, is that necessary? You, you need, you're going to call the teacher? But then you know when someone gets comfortable. And you know they can stay like that the whole fucking day. <laughs> and eventually you lose it and you go, fine, here goes my horsey, clippity cloppity cloppity cloppity, take my quick fucking asshole. <laughs> but shame, one day my dad had to take me to chess. Now, my dad will never admit this because I'm the only child and he loves me too much, but I'll admit it on his behalf. But my dad really wishes that I played rugby just for one season. Just one. Not because he wanted me to fit in, but because he wanted to fit in. With the other dads. He just wanted that experience. I, I can't even blame him. He's, he's just a man. He just wanted that experience just once in his life of standing there next to the rugby field, next to the other fathers, with those short shorts. <laughs> Just the one ball hanging out. <laughs> it was always the one. How could they not feel it? There was a breeze. <laughs> and one day my dad had to take me to chase. Now you can imagine, it's a school hall full of kids playing chase. The English private school parents, they're there on the sidelines watching their kids. My dad's walking up and down behind them. <laughs> Still the one ball hanging out. <laughs> so bored. I'm getting excited because I realize I'm gonna win this game. I don't know how it's possible I'm playing against one of the good kids. But I'm not asking questions. I'm just like, yes, I'm going to win a game for the first time in my life. But now out of the corner of my eye, I see my dad and he's standing there. He's like, okay. <laughs> I'm sitting there. Cheers. <laughs> going to win. Cheers. A few minutes later, it's like, okay. Thank you. Quickly, just two seconds. <laughs> I'm sitting there. Go sit in the car. <laughs> Third time, now he's waving, he's gone, okay. just, just quickly, okay. eventually I look at him, no, what? what do you want? My dad looks at me, he goes, me leave. <laughs> don't know, don't clap. Then it was like full lockdown. The child I'm playing against sees this happening, calls the teacher, mammy's daddy's telling him the moves. Shh. 
she comes over. So please come over here. What are we telling your son to do? Now, my dad's English is even more shit than mine, okay? Now he has to explain something in English that has no meaning in the first place. So now we're standing there. No, it's, uh, it, it's like a milli, but it's, um, it's a motivation milli, okay? It's, a, it's just a motivation milli. It, look, it doesn't mean anything. She goes, sir, that doesn't even make sense. You're obviously telling him what to move, which is against the rules. You're disqualified. I got sent home, lost all my games that day. I was so angry with my dad. I got him. I'm telling you, Sam, I broke a window. <laughs> Just let out that frustration. And, and you know, I haven't even said this. The show is called Feeling Good because that is where I, I am in my life right now. I am feeling good. And, you, you know, I feel good about my growing up years, you know, when, when I was in them. You know, I was bullied a bit and stuff, and I thought it didn't always feel good. But now when I look back, I think it was actually good. Yeah, so I talk about that a lot. But, you know, it's becoming harder because I started com comedy 12 years ago. So I was normally on stage the youngest person in the room because the audience were all over 18. So I could talk about anything. <laughs> Everyone got the reference, you know. Now I'm at an age, I'm in my 30s, it's still young, but I'm at an age now where, you know, the references don't make sense to everyone, you know? Because, I mean, like, Sam is sitting there, he doesn't even know, in, and he's in IT, and he doesn't even know the internet used to make a noise. <laughs> we, were, we were the best generation, you know why? Because when we hit puberty, the internet happened at the same time. Do you know how revolutionary that was, dude? Yes, it was super slow internet. You had to download an image one titty at a time, but still, we had internet. We used to time our parents when they go out to buy bread and milk, because you had to determine how much alone time do you have with the internet when your parents leave. And my parents, we live close to a shop, seven minutes, that's all I had. And then they leave and you're like, shit, I've got seven minutes with the internet. And, and there wasn't the luxury, ooh, take your laptop, go lock yourself in the bedroom. No, you're vulnerable. Because you're there by the front door, by the home phone. Because you had to unplug the home phone to plug in the fucking internet. Sam's just like, what's our home phone? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> and then finally, now Sam, finally you make it onto a website. Now after five minutes of just watching the computer start, the patience we had, because we still had to start it like this. <laughs> now you're finally there on sexymommies.com. And then you hear the gate opening, the car's coming back up the driveway. You look back at the screen, this mommy is fucking here. Okay. She's head and shoulders. You're like, come on, mommy! Load, mommy, load! Fuck the nipple, just a clavicle, mommy. Just, just a clavicle. Then the door starts opening, you panic, abort, abort, start unplugging cables. And then on top of that, the internet's making a scary noise. It's like the birds here in Australia. You can't sleep in in Canberra. Every morning, 6 a.m. <laughs> Thank you for that reaction because I, I, I did that joke a few times in Melbourne and then sometimes it got no reaction and it's quite embarrassing if you commit that hard to something. <laughs> it's just...
TV is also, was, was also special back then, because if you missed it, you missed it, you know? There's TikTok now, which is, which is great, but that's dangerous. There's a challenge that got banned the other day, the Bone Crusher Challenge. It's three people standing in a row, the two people on the side are in on the joke, person in the middle is the victim. So the people on the side, they jump. Person in the middle thinks, I must also jump. As they jump, the people on the side kick out their feet from under them, you end up falling on your back. And TikTok released a statement saying, please don't do this, because kids all over the world started getting seriously injured. And I read this and I thought, yo, that's so hectic. But also, kids today must just toughen the fuck up. Just, <laughs> just a little. We had WWE, wrestling, SmackDown. Every sleepover you went to, someone would be like, Dude, just lie still for a second. I just want to try something I saw on WWE last night. Stop resisting. It's Rey Mysterio's signature move. It's called the Dead Fuck. But don't worry, I think I'll nail it. Ah! <laughs> Jeez, that was like being on a mechanical bull. That this guy was... <laughs> I mean, you had a birthday party, someone just comes from behind with a garden chair. Does this hurt? Yes! Yes! But you know, my, I would say my biggest regret you know, from growing up is that we didn't give ourselves the opportunity to just be kids. You know, now, now I know this sounds so conservative, but I'm starting to think maybe there's a reason the legal drinking age was, or is, sorry, 18. No, that, that is an appropriate amount of time to be a child. We, we, we cut it short, you know, and I'm, I'm sad about that, that we didn't just give ourselves the opportunity to just be careless, carefree teenagers for long enough, you know? I mean, 14, 15 years old, we started doing adult things, drinking, smoking. It's not like we had a choice. <laughs> you know, it's not like our parents forced us, but I mean, if you want to be anywhere on the social ladder, you had to be doing those things at the house parties. And the most embarrassing part, we took ourselves so seriously. <laughs> we took ourselves so seriously. I mean, every house party you went to, there'd be a big bonfire in the middle and we'd sit around the bonfire and you'd stare into the bonfire. The deeper you stared, the deeper you were. That's what made you cool, if you were deep. That's also what the girls like. They like the guys who were deep, like fucking. <laughs> Marilyn Manson, feelings. So we all wanted to be deep. And so we'd sit there around the bonfire. You stare into the bonfire. And there was one dick with a guitar. <laughs> and he could only play one song. It was always safe tonight. <laughs> and this is the sad thing. We weren't singing along like teenagers. We weren't going, safe tonight, hoi, hoi. And for the break of dawn, come tomorrow. It wasn't cool to act a fool like that. You had to sing along softly. The softer you sang, the deeper you were. <laughs> Keep eye contact with the bonfire. Sit there. Say to me. And 
I would always sit there going, guys, shouldn't we be doing drugs or something? <laughs> this is fucking boring. And I will have you know, Sydney, I was cool enough to be a part of the Safe Tonight circle. I did make that circle. Next circle, didn't make it. That was for the beautiful popular kids. That was the hubbly bubbly circle. Is that still a thing, Sam? You know what that is? Hubbly bubbly? Shisha, hookah pipe. You know what shisha? Shisha. Because you guys now do the Bluetooth hubbly bubbly, but the, the shisha. <laughs> That, that was the old one. It was, a, it was a tower like this, man. You put flavored leaves in there and then tin foil and holes in it with a toothpick and then a burning coal. And then at the bottom, there's a vase with water, man. And then pipes coming out of it. And then you... And then sometimes, man, we'd replace the water with vodka and get fucked up. And then, and then other times, you put water in the bottom, uh, uh, so instead of water in the bottom, you put vodka in the bottom man, and weed at the top, and then some children died. Um, but, so that we'd have the hubbly bubbly. That was a special circle for the, for the most popular kids in the grade. I wasn't part of it. I had to sit outside and watch like a dirty pervert. Because they would play this game. They would play this game. So one guy takes a big pull of the hubbly. Normally, the hottest guy in the grade, think your first team rugby captain. He takes big pull, gets his lungs full of smoke. Then he will French kiss the girl next to him. Full on, open mouth, done. <laughs> now you're thinking, ooh, Sculpt, that's rough. That's just the beginning. <laughs> Step one. She receives this. <laughs> she then turns. Now, it's a circle. There's another guy here on the other side. Turns to him. <laughs> Passes the smoke on. Then, that continues all in a circle until it gets back to the original guy who now French kissed first, he now does it last as well, and then he will turn his head and go, <laughs> That was the joke. That was the game. To see, could they pass the smoke all in a circle from that one original puff? Could they pass that smoke all in a circle? In other words, could it go <laughs> into his lungs out of his lungs into her lungs. Ah! Out of her lungs into his lungs. Ah! In, out, in, out, back into his lungs. Poof! Could there still be smoke left at the end? And you couldn't make a big deal out of it. Because you're going to be lame if you're the one going... You had to act casual. Yo, whatever. This is what we do at the house parties. It's just the most attractive kids in the school making out, but it's fine. <laughs> this is normal. And the most frustrating part was, in my grade, there were more girls than boys. So at some stage in the circle, two girls. <laughs> I know this is a fetish, okay? But I mean, as a straight 15-year-old boy, this is the shit that you Google in the afternoon. And it's always the hottest two girls in the grade. And now it's happening live in front of your eyes. And you couldn't make a big deal out of it because you're going to ruin the vibe if you're the one going... Oh shit, okay. Okay, it's all done, look. Oh shit, I just looked again, it's fine. Um, actually, I can't do this. Uh, Donovan, thank you for the nice house party. I have to go home immediately. <laughs> Nothing serious, just a project to end in on Monday. <laughs> and then you get home and I mean, Sam, you know. 
you get home and you just fuck in. <laughs> Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Scott Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Normally, normally at the end of the show, I would say spread the word, you know. Um, but you know, I'm very blessed. My shows in in, in Perth is sold out, so you know. But uh, the plan is to come back next year. So spread the word for next year, please. Uh, if, you, if you see me coming again, please tell everyone, especially the South Africans. I know you guys are on all these uh, WhatsApp groups, so you can send racist jokes. Um, <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm joking. Um, but <laughs> it's just a joke. Um, but you know, and, and also, and also, you know, next year, invite your Aussie friends. I mean, Louise, I saw you laugh. Don't pretend like you didn't. I'm, I put a lot of effort into making the show international. And you know, my, my tickets are $30, okay? I think for only $1 more than that Falcon Koala. <laughs> It's not a bad deal, okay? Um, thank you for the wine. My name is Kalpa Saidna. Thank you.